Good morning, everybody. We are going to start this session. It's a Metta recital. I recite Metta passages, and you just listen to it, and then we give some instructions on meditation. So let me begin with reciting the Metta Recycle. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, Long, large, medium, short, subtle, or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, may all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will. Should anyone wish harm to another? As a mother would risk her own life to protect her own child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate the power of his heart. One should cultivate for the whole world the heart of all the living children. The power of the and all around are not started without further permission, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down or in a way, one should give up this mindfulness. This is called divine injury here. Not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed in some desire, one constantly again to work in both. With this metta thought in mind, let us sit in relaxed upright position, in comfortable posture, and close your eyes. 
Inclus on the left, crossing thumbs to each other. Right hand on the left. And then focus your mind on your breathing. And breathe slowly and deeply. For about two, three minutes. When you breathe out, let as much breath comes out of your lungs to make it empty. When you breathe normally, you don't breathe out entire breath in our lungs. And then when we breathe in, we can breathe lung full of breath. And that is what we do when we do long inhaling and long exhaling. That helps us focus our mind on the breath. Also, we can notice the breath tucking our nostrils as we breathe in. We feel the lungs filling with air. We feel our diaphragm pushing down. As we breathe out, we feel diaphragm pushes up. Lungs are empty in air. And the breath leads through the nostrils. I think our nostrils. When we do this several times, this awareness helps us to keep the mind on the breath. So that you can notice the beginning, 
middle and end of each inhaling and each exhaling. Notice the breath happening in the nostrils when you inhale, filling your lungs, pushing back friends down, and when you breathe out, back friends pushes up, lungs are empty, and then the breath leaves the nostrils, touching the nostrils. When we become aware of this, this is what is called being aware of the whole breath body. And then it helps us to relax our body, the breath, Feelings and the mind. Notice in this relaxed state, we breathe in and breathe out. At first, it becomes deliberate, inhaling and exhaling. Later on, it becomes very natural, automatic, inhaling and exhaling. Then the gross breath becomes subtle breath. It becomes subtler and subtler and subtler. And when the breath is subtle, body becomes even more calm, more relaxed, more peaceful. At that time, it is possible for you to feel even sleepy, but don't give into sleepiness. Stay alert and awake. If you if you feel sleepy, open your eyes and focus mind on the breath. Close it. Then sleep in a space away. And continue to focus mind on the breath. If sleepiness is persistently arising, you will feel very drowsy. Then pinch your ear off with the index finger and thumb hard enough. To feel the pinch. If that doesn't work, don't hesitate to stand up until your sleepiness fades away and quietly sit down and start focusing mind on the bed. So when the mind is free from sleepiness and drowsiness, it is possible for you to become more excited. And the opposite of sleepiness can arise, that is restlessness and void. These two factors go together. Restlessness is due to worry. Worry is due to incomplete things you have done in the past. 
deeper becomes out there in him. The Buddha realized all this by himself. He did not have books, teachers to learn all these things from. No internet, no cell phone, no YouTube, no satellite, nothing. All he realized by himself. That is amazing, marvelous, very profound wisdom. He had with that wisdom, that profundity, he taught us the Dhamma. And millions of people following its instruction were liberated from suffering in the past. And even today, we can attain ourselves to that state of liberation if you follow his footsteps, his instructions. So we must have full confidence in the Buddha's enlightenment to get rid of our doubt. What I mentioned are in short called hindrances, those are stumbling blocks of our attaining jhana daily concentration, developing our mindfulness. So we have to get rid of them in order to continue our practice. Once we are born rid of them, we gain concentration. We sharpen our mind, cleans the mind, makes it one-pointed. With that one-pointed state of mind, we can see ourselves more clearly and deeply. To get rid of our greed, Hatred and delusion. Love and loss and more. So, with these few words of instruction, let us try to stay focused in the mind on our breath. Not even the breath rising and falling. Appearing and disappearing, our feelings rising and falling, appearing and disappearing, our perception is rising and falling, appearing and disappearing, our thoughts are appearing and disappearing, our consciousness will become aware or rising and falling. All these are called aggregates, the breath, feeling, perception, thoughts and consciousness. They are constantly rising and falling. Along with the breath, so we are in a state of flux. Our cells are changing, moving. Nothing is static or fixed. Everything in us and around us is changing, appearing and disappearing. 
and we all remain noticing, focusing our mind on this reality. We start visualizing and calling for the breath. So we spend a few more minutes, at least half an hour, meditating on this something, focusing mind on the breath, noticing rather than holding on the in the breath. Healing, perception, thought, and consciousness. They all change at the same time. They all change all the time. That is what we call impermanent. So let us spend next half an hour. And then at 10 o'clock, and I will talk. who are totally new to meditation. Two, three, okay. So, This is an introduction to meditation. Therefore, we have to say something very basic so that even though some others uh, may be practicing meditation in open, 
and some of them may even be advanced meditators, and yet it is not too much uh, predominant or too simple for them to listen to the introductory talk on meditation. We base our meditation on the Buddha's own teaching. And therefore, even though we hear the same thing again and again, we will, we will not be tired of listening to Dhamma. And rather we can Clarify if there is any doubt with regard to the practice and learn something new from this listening to introductory talks. And some of you might be teaching meditation to others, and therefore it is very useful for them to listen to introduction to meditation talk. <clears throat> Therefore, I'm like, uh, I like to speak on the very base, basic uh, practice of meditation. We practice meditation for very lofty purpose, beginning with very simple way. We want to clean our mind. And therefore, we have to have a method to clean the mind. So we have to apply a lot of very strong detergent to clean the mind. And that is outline in great discourse on mindfulness meditation. Great discourse of four foundations of medita mindfulness meditation. There, there Buddha has given us at the very outset the purpose of meditation. Why do we meditate? Instead of doing various other things, why do we meditate? Not because it has become very popular. Meditation has become very popular and we just don't want to join the rally and go along with the crowd. But we do it with this very noble purpose in mind. And there are five purposes of meditating. What are the five pur purposes? First is Purification of mind, number one. Why do we want to purify our mind? Because it is polluted, impure. Originally it is luminous, but adventitious defilement defiled his mind. Originally it is pure, clean. For instance, you see very tiny little babies. They are so beautiful. Their minds are very clean, not 100% clean. Potential of pollution is there in their mind because they express their greed all the time. 
they express their grief by crying, demanding mother's attention, and demanding for milk and so on. And yet, overall, baby's spines are very clean. And that is an indication of the fact that the mind is originally luminous, plain. As we know, and as baby is growing, you can see the defile, the mind is defiling. And we, as we become older, we recognize this. We recognize the mind is getting more and more impure and unclean, filling it with defilements. And therefore, we want to clean the mind. When the mind is impure and unclean, with that un impure or unclean mind, when we speak or do things, the suffering follows us like the car follows the hoofs or the of that poster car. This is a very beautiful simile. The Buddha himself used to illustrate the burden of our impure state of mind. The, when the mind is impure, with that impure state of mind, when we speak, the words are not going to be pure, clean. Those words can be sometimes Buddha said, mukha sattena vitu deti. These words that we utter with impure state of mind can become like a dagger. They can go into the into the bones, marrow, and we all experience this in our life. And then, not only the one who uttered these impure words like daggers suffer, but also the one who receives it, the recipients of these words will be hurt. And it can become contagious. On the other hand, when the mind is pure and clean, with that state of mind, if we speak or do something, the results follow us like our own shadow. How heavy the shadow is, we even don't feel it. So, if we want to be happy, don't look for money or status, wealth, neighbors. Look at our mind. When you look at our mind, honestly and sincerely, we can see where the, the source of our problem is within our own mind. Once we clean this mind, of course we cannot clean it very quickly. At once, it takes some time and constant and regular training of cleaning the mind. There are various methods of cleaning the mind. There is a very thick dissertation 
written by Dr. Buddha Bosa. <laughs> this was the marker. That dissertation is good enough to give two doctorates to him. That is called Visuddhi Mahatma. That book has explained one discourse called Rastaganita Sutta in Madhya Nikaya. And there we find seven stages of purification. Seven stages. Therefore, it is not a very simple thing, but any difficult thing can become simple through constant practice. If you do not practice, difficult things remain to be difficult, and not only that, the mind can become a trophy. That area can simply become rusty, can never be used. And therefore, we have to train the mind to clean itself. Auto cleaning system. Auto cleaning system. And that is called <laughs> meditation. There are two types of meditation. One is called insight meditation, other is called concentration meditation. They are called in Pali, Samatha and Vipassana. Samatha means tranquilizing the mind, calming the mind, making it peaceful. Tranquility meditation or Samatha meditation. The personal meditation is a method that sharpens the mind, not only calming it, but sharpening it. Calmness is one thing, and sharpness is another. It becomes sharp when we practice mindfulness. And it is called in Pali Vipassana. I'm still on the theme of cleaning the mind. These are the two systems of cleaning the mind. They are called Samatha meditation and Vipassana meditation. Sometimes people call Jnana meditation and uh, insight meditation. Vipassana means seeing in a very special way. What is the special way? When we see our, when we have eyes, how can we train this eyes to see something special? Friends, we are not putting new lens of the cataract, we put new lens or put new glasses, changing glasses. That way you cannot see anything different from anybody else. We see the same thing. But the special way is seeing something with wisdom. Seeing something with wisdom. When we gain concentration, combined with mindfulness, we see things, we see, see things exactly as they are. We see things exactly as they are. Don't we see things exactly as they are when we open our eyes? We don't see things as they are. We see only superficial appearance. That's all. When we combine concentration with mindfulness, we see things in a very special way. What are the things? 
What are the things we see special way? Not this object outside. This uh, seal, this object we can see around us. We see in a very special way ourselves. We see ourselves in a very special way. What are the ourselves? Our body, feelings, perceptions, thoughts, and consciousness. Friends, this is all we have. We are constituted with this high, what you call, aggregates. And if we understand them exactly as they are, we liberate ourselves from suffering. Unfortunately, we don't see them exactly as they are. And therefore, we have to develop our mindfulness combined with concentration. Concentration and mindfulness are not two separate subjects of meditation. These are two sides of the same coin. Without, without concentration, you cannot have mindfulness, nor can you have mindfulness without concentration. Concentration is the last step for the novel way told by Sama Samadhi. Mindfulness is the seventh step. Sama Sati. Sama Sati. What are they called by? Nobody called by? Right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. These are seven steps, eight uh, steps of the novel age old path. Now, concentration and mindfulness, therefore, are absolutely necessary factors that we have to develop in order to see our own body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. To purify our mind, we must see our body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. Purify our mind. Now, now that is number one purpose of meditation. Number one. I said there are five purposes. This is first purpose. Purifying the mind. There are seven steps of purification, including Sila, Kitta, Ditti, Doubt, Durpad, Nonpad, Tanpad, and uh, Vision and uh, Vision and Knowledge and so forth. There are seven steps. Number one. Number two, to overcome sorrow and lamentation. We meditate or to overcome sorrow and lamentation. Sorrow arises because of not seeing things as they really are. We lament because we don't see things as they really are. I mentioned we practice meditation combined with the samatha and vipassana to see things as they really are. When we do not develop these two together, we will have sorrow and lamentation. So we develop mindfulness and concentration to overcome sorrow and lamentation. That's the number. That's the number. 
two purposes. Third purpose is to overcome suffering and grief. Suffering and grief. Friends, suffering is all over our life. Suffering is all over our life. If somebody says that they don't have suffering, that is purely because of utter ignorance. If somebody says, I don't have suffering, that is purely because of total, complete foolishness. To put it bluntly, foolishness. Only fool can say that they don't have suffering. Even if somebody has learned various subject, today if you think of subject available for us to learn, there is no end to it, end to that. There are millions of subjects that we can learn. Even if we learn all of them, have 10 PhDs, still we are ignorant, foolish, because we don't understand suffering. No matter how many degrees we have, we are still have ignorance. So, those who have ignorance, they think that they don't have suffering. And when they have suffering, suffering and grief. Dukkha Dhamanasa. Suffering and grief. These two also go together. In order to overcome suffering and grief, you meditate. Then we meditate, that is number three. Number four, we meditate to put ourselves on the right path. Right path. And this right path is called one and only path, a Karayana marker. Right path is called one and only path. When you see, when you hear the one and only path, you might wonder what that is. There are various paths to go to various places. There is a path to go to hell. You can go there. There is a path to go become an animal. You can go there. We can, there are paths to go to heaven. We can go there, follow in that path. We can go to ghost and goblins world. There's a path we follow there and go there. There are many paths to go to many different places. But there is only one path that, that leads to liberation from all this. That is called a car in a mark. One path. Only path. Only path is the path to liberation is the path, Samatha Vipassana path. So, Samatha Vipassana path is the only path that leads us to liberation from something. Nyaya Sarvindama, realizing it. That path is to be realized, not just to study or discuss, write books or have debates, all these things are peripheral. 
the core of the real path is the realization. We have to realize. Realize the path. What is that path? It, in detail, noble eightfold path. We practice meditation to realize noble eightfold path. Meditation is a part of noble eightfold path. And we practice the path, noble eightfold path. This practice is a part of the noble eightfold path to realize the whole path. We take a part of it and practice and practice and practice until practice becomes perfect to realize the whole system. That is called Samatha Vipassana path. That is number four purpose, four purpose. Last purpose is to attain liber liberation, nibbana. Nibbana Satyagiriyaya. Realize Nibbana. For this five purpose we meditate. Five four purpose. Friends, this is the entire summary of the purpose of meditation. We are not just sitting to form the cushions and to have marks and to have a number of hours. You know, when you want to fly, become a pilot, you have to have a number of hours training. Then you can become a pilot. You have to do certain things, certain number of hours to qualify to do certain things. Not for that purpose we meditate. Not for that purpose. But we meditate <laughs> in order to liberate our, ourselves from samsaric suffering. For that we meditate. Therefore, there are five purposes we meditate. I want to summarize it for you to remember and take each of them separately and think very carefully. Then you will understand how profound this system is. Number one, purification of mind. Number two, overcome sorrow and lamentation. Number three, to overcome suffering and grief. Number four, to put ourselves on the right path. Number five, attaining liberation, nibbana. For this five, four purpose we meditate. Now, When we, when we say meditate, what do we do in meditation? As I said, we don't sit to count the number of minutes or hours or days or weeks or months that we set on cushion. We meditate to Realize ourselves. Friends, we don't know ourselves. We don't know ourselves. We always try to see others. We don't introspect ourselves to see what is happening to us. And that is why we always try to People say, I want to teach him a lesson. But we don't say, I want to learn a lesson. So we meditate to learn a lesson. To study ourselves. 
we meditate. When we try to study ourselves, we develop mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is paying attention to whatever is happening at any given moment, paying attention to it without greed, hatred, and illusion. Paying attention to something that happened to us without greed, hatred, and illusion. For that moment, that very moment, we free our minds, minds from greed, hatred, and illusion. It is maybe one second, ten seconds, a minute, one minute, two minutes, doesn't matter how long. That very moment, we, we temporarily freeze our greed, hatred, and freeze. You know, putting into, you freeze. And we freeze temporarily our greed, hatred, and illusion. Or we liberate the mind from greed, hatred, and illusion to see what is happening at that very moment. That is how we practice mindfulness. For instance, Buddha has given this instruction to Venerable Ravana. Ravana was Buddha's son, not Buddha's son, Siddhartha's son. Anyway, when Ravana became a monk, uh, Buddha gave several discourses to Ravana. He saw a son. So, Buddha trained him to purify his mind in a very simple way. One, one day he asked Ravana, he, he washed his feet. When Buddha sat down, Ravana brought some water and asked him to, before he sat down, he would have wanted to wash his feet. Buddha washed his feet and uh, he, this was the container. He threw away the remaining water and asked Ravana, um, Did you see me throwing away water? He said, Yes. Ravana, if somebody lies, Somebody lies, that person throws away all his good qualities. Like this water throwing away. After that, he took the board and showed, he showed to him, Can you see this inside? Ravana, can you see inside? He said, Yes. What can you see inside? No water. Is a rounder. If somebody lies, his mind is empty of all good qualities like this. Then he turned him down. Malish. Then he asked, Can you say this? Yes, whatever. He turned him down. Then Buddha said, Rama, when somebody lies, he turned his back to all good qualities. Right. Then he turned his up and showed Ravana, can you see what it is? There is not drop of water, it is dry now. And Buddha said, Ravana, when somebody lies, his mind is like this, empty of all good qualities. 
That is why Buddha said, Ekanda Mahatitasa, Musavati to Jagadino, Vituna for Loka, Nati Papam Akutu. If one violates one of the noble principles, that person can violate any principle. When somebody lies, he can do any wrong thing. So, and then to the ground, therefore, this is how he trained him to be mindful. Therefore, Rahula, before you say something, you ask yourself, are these words I'm going to say? No, before you do something. The deed, word, and thought, three things. When you do something, before you do it, you think, is this action hurt me, hurt others, or, uh, or hurt both hit me and them? If it is so, don't do it. Before you do, do something, if that action is going to benefit you, benefit others, benefit both, do it. While you are planning to do something in future, any action, if you see that deed is going to hurt you, hurt others, hurt God, don't plan to do that. While you are doing something, if it is hurting you, hurting others, don't do that. Similarly, when you are going to say something, No, when yeah, when you uh, say when you say something, if it is going to hurt you, going to hurt others, don't say it. When you think something, if it is hurting you, hurting others, don't think of that thought. After having done something, you think, has my action hurt somebody? I should have not done that. Has my action benefit me and others and both? I should do it. While I'm saying something, to somebody while I'm talking, if it, is, if it is hurting somebody, hurting me, hurting both, I must stop it right there, right then and there. So, this is how Buddha trained Rahul to be mindful. In other words, mindfulness is looking at the mind looking at our own mind. When we are doing something, when we are planning to do something, when we, are, when we have done something, has that or is it or will it hurt me, hurt others, hurt God? We should not do that. That is the way to train the mind. We normally People normally think that uh, when they uh, say do some wash, wash dishes, very famous example, people say, when you wash dishes, be mindful of washing dishes. Friends, washing dishes is almost automatic. But while doing that, you got to pay attention to your mind. 
with the beat the rashas in the mind, hate the rashas in the mind, or confusion the rashas in the mind. Then and there, you got to get rid of that greed, hatred, and delusion that moment. That is how we train the mind to be mindful. So the mindfulness is always something we are paying attention to our mind without greed, hatred, and delusion. Then, this is called Sampajan, the mindfulness and uh, clear comprehension both go together. We understand very clearly the, the purpose, the field, suitability, and non delusion. There are four types of clear comprehension. Four types of clear comprehension. We have to clearly comprehend, as I mentioned, the purpose of doing what we are doing. And then we have to clearly understand that the, the means that we employ to do something to accomplish something, the suitability. For instance, when we uh, use uh, uh, the breath, for instance, as an object of meditation, we must ask, is the breath a suitable subject for me to develop mindfulness? And the answer is yes. Why is that? Because the mindfulness, in mindfulness practice, remember, we always see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. In mindfulness practice, we see impermanence, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. Can we see these three characteristics in our breathing? Is it therefore suitable for attaining this goal? Yes. When we put, pay attention to our breath, breath is impermanent. Breath is impermanent. That is why we have to breathe 30,000 times a day. We have to breathe 30,000 times a day. If you count, we breathe 30,000 times a day. Breathe out 30,000 times a day. We, because we have to bring oxygen into, into us, in order to live, we have to bring oxygen and charge our depleted hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is red blood cell. Red blood cell. And red blood cell are in our lungs, collected all from all over our body and come to heart, heart sends the lungs. As we breathe in, we charge these red blood cells with oxygen, recharge, and send back to the heart, heart pumps, and then charge all these 56 trillion cells in the body with oxygen because every cell needs oxygen to survive. And that is happening every minute. Always 
circulating oxygen throughout our body. And it helps to pump 2,000 gallons of blood <laughs> throughout our body. 2,000 gallons of blood throughout our body. Each, of each cell needs oxygen. That means I talk, I will talk about impermanence. Why so many times we pump oxygen into lungs to charge the blood cell? Because this blood cell lose oxygen every second. They lose impermanent. If it is permanent, we have to breathe only once. Since it is impermanent, we have to breathe it again and again and again and again and again. Even if we sleep, we have to do that. Even if you are unconscious, you have to do that. So, is it suitable subject for us to know impermanent? What is the suitable subject? The breath. And this is happening all the time, and then we have been, this is not satisfactory. We wish it to be permanent, but it is not permanent. What is impermanent is unsatisfactory. Yadav is Dukkha. Whatever is impermanent is unsatisfactory. Yadav is Jantam Dukkha. Yam Dukkha Tadanatta. Whatever is impermanent is unsatisfactory. What is unsatisfactory is without self. Without self. Self is something that we use for our communication purpose. We use the word self. Myself, yourself, yourself, himself, and so forth. The word we self we use only for the communication purpose. Otherwise, it is not something that permanently existing. Nothing. Friends, when everything is impermanent, how can there be one entity permanent? Everything is impermanent. Therefore, the breath is a very good subject to use in meditation to understand, to realize all the three characteristics. Three Characteristic that is that you can find in everything. Everything in the universe is marked with these three characteristics. Everything. What are the three characteristics? Anitya, Dukkha, Anatta. Impermanent, unsatisfactory, and selflessness. And therefore, when clear comprehension, I said, First, clear comprehension is understanding the purpose. <coughs> Second, clear comprehension is <coughs> suitability, suitable of, suitable of our subject. Third, clear comprehension is <coughs> non delusion, the domain. 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 What is our domain, our field? Our domain or our field is our own body and mind. Where can we find Anitya Dukkanatta? Impermanent, unsatisfactory, and selflessness. Where else can we find except our own body and mind? They are constantly changing, constantly changing. Changing is taking place so deeply and subtly that we cannot see with our eyes, except after many years we can see grey hair or no hair or wrinkled skin, weak eyes, poor hearing, poor taste. 
Who was Smith? Wobbling, walking, and so forth. Then all these things happen. Then only we realize impermanence, which actually is taking place from the moment of our conception in the mother's womb. They have been changing. Changing. Once they become multi cells, unicellular being become multi cellular beings. And after nine months, come out with three years of self and keep changing. In their, they keep proliferating inside, proliferating outside, and we keep building it from food. <laughs> soft food, hard food, drinks and so forth. We replace them, they are wearing out. Again we replace, again we are wearing. How many times we eat, morning we eat, morning we eat, at night we eat, in between we eat, in order to replace all it. This mechanism is going on automatically all the time. So, seeing this exactly as they are, is the personal meditation. And the last clear comprehension is non-confusion. Non-confusion. Asamo 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 means you don't want to get confused. We have to have a very clear comprehension of all this happening to us. I think, friends, you heard the bell, the gong. So I want to end this talk, and um, I'm supposed to end it at 10 minutes ago. Anyway, uh, subject is so deep, and tomorrow I'll give another talk, and I think we have interviews also right? in the afternoon. So if you have questions, you can ask afternoon using into that. Okay, I hope you learn something new and try to remember uh, some of these instructions. Have a very good day. Thank you. So, uh, uh,